Hey everybody, Andy here. Got a great one today on interviewing how to ace any job interview. We're in day three of my three day interviewing workshop. So get in the chat, say hi. I wanna tell you what today's all about. Uh, just a real quick intro, then we got a lot to cover today. But if you are just joining us or just jumping in, uh, day one was how to introduce yourself. That was a, a wonderful way to construct a one minute intro uh, so when you get into an interview, an interview uh, you can appropriately introduce the high points, the things that matter about you, and you can do it in a tight form. And then yesterday, day two, we came back with story selection. So how do you choose the right stories? I talked a little bit about what stories are generally good to have. I'm going to recap that in a minute here. And then also uh, how, to, how to decide what kind of criteria to use. Is it better to go with something that's more relevant or something that's more recent? I walked through a bunch of, of criteria, half a dozen or seven points there as well. If you miss those, check them out. But even if you haven't seen them, it's okay. You're going to get a whole lot out of today. It's not like you actually have to watch all these in order, although it's nice. But today's going to be, it's, it, today's in a number of, of sections, so to speak. I'm going to recap the stories that I want you to be ready for. I'm going to talk with you ever so briefly about the different ways that employers format their interview questions. I'm also going to walk you through 11 different groupings of question types and how I would consider them. What is it that I want you to know about the questions and how to approach answering it? And in that part of the talk, uh, there are a lot of additional assets that I have on my YouTube channel or in my job search coaching program that you can use to kind of fill fill in any areas that you might want to dig deeper on. This today's going to be a wonderful curation of a lot of the material that I have and and virtually all of it is free. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to I'm going to talk about a really good technique and a way to construct virtually any interview response. And then I'm going to walk you through a case study of one of my uh, members of my job search coaching program. Uh, she's a boot camper. I recently had a one on one session with her, and I just thought her story, her prep, what she was looking for, how she needed to improve, and what I ultimately taught her to do was really something great to share with you. So that's what today's all about. If you've been enjoying this week, uh, and you've been getting a lot of value out of it, make sure to share this information. This is going to live on my YouTube channel. I, I, do, I do not intend on taking this three-day workshop down, so you come, come back and visit it, uh, the teaching portions and the Q&A, and, and make sure to, to send a signal to YouTube that you're enjoying it by clicking the like button, and be subscribed to the channel because you know it hurts me whenever you miss anything that I put out there on the internets. Okay, uh, let's see. Everything looks good. And uh, I wanna I wanna say a quick hello because I, you know, I, I know a lot of you have been with me the, and going the distance. And it have you noticed who's number one on the on on the call sheet here? Which is mom is the first in the chat. Uh, thanks, mom. Love you. Great to great to see you. And uh, I just you know I miss you terribly. I hope you're doing well. And Flavia, oh Flavia is now famous because we hot uh, sat her on. On on uh, on the first session on Tuesday where we did the the introduction hot seats. Thanks, give her a shout out for that. Dave Coburn, Mike Tierney, Michael Moore, wonderful to have you. Truckerman, Medina, Kurt, Daryl, Jamie, and M Sport, and everybody else. All right, let's let's dive in uh, today. But I, while I get get rolling here, can you go into the chat and let me know just just in one little one little 200 character, whatever, what your favorite part of the session has, has these sessions have, have been so far. So what was your favorite moments in, in how to introduce yourself and how to select the right stories? And then speaking of stories, I want to just recap very quickly. As a hirer, as an executive recruiter, as any hiring official, recruiter, whoever it is that you're uh, speaking with at an organization. It's my opinion, based on loads of data, loads of experience, loads of interviews, placing more than 600 people at over 200 companies, not to mention coaching tens of thousands of you individually, 
that these are the six magical stories that you should have in the tank when you walk into any interview. So yes, there are questions like, tell me about yourself and, and, and why do you wanna work here and all that, those are all great. But when, you, when it comes to storytelling, make sure you can talk about your passion, your problem solving, the way that you provide value, what is your unique value, how you develop people, you don't need to be a manager to do that, how you serve people, how you serve customers or people, how, how you've handled a mistake. Now I have a video out there about the six best stories to tell in a job interview. I break this down, I talk about each one. So that's the, that's the first order of business. So I just wanna make sure for completeness of this talk that you recognize that those are out there. Now, earlier in the year, back in January, this is 2022, back in, back in, back in January, I put out a video on the three types of job interview questions with the three formats of the job interview questions that employers ask and how to answer them. And I wanna talk about those here too. Just to recap, there are behavioral interview questions, there are project specific questions, and they're generally, they're generally situational questions. And let me just tell you what these are, and then I'm going to give you a reference so that you can you can watch it. And then I want to look at the chat to see what some of the favorite moments were. Behavioral interviewing questions are generally questions about your past. The employer is, is trying to, as the name as the name connotates, evaluate a behavior because they think that past behaviors are predictors of future behaviors. I don't think anything could be further from the truth, but that's what they think. Those are the types of questions that they ask. And so it's things like, please tell me about a time when you organize something. Please tell me about a time when you disagreed with somebody. And they're looking for your behavior. So that's what a behavior question is. It's about the past. Project specific question, this is kind of my nomenclature for it, but basically when an employer says to you, you know, hey, Dan, I see this uh, project on your resume. Can you walk me through how you did that? And now you're going to tell them exactly what the steps are that you took in order to implement that. That's They're picking something you did. It could be a task. It could be a project. It could be an, an initiative. It could be something that you had to go through in order to attain something, whatever it is, but they choose it. It's from your past and they're asking you to tell them about it. That's a project specific question. And then there's a situational question. This is a question about the future. This is a question like, hey, we've got this customer. She's been a real problem. How would you handle her? Hey, we want you to come in and build out the marketing team. How would you do that? They're basically presenting an example of a future situation. We have this problem in our environment. We've been struggling with it. What would you do? Any of those, they're putting you in a situation and they're asking you what you would do. These are basically the way the questions are asked in any type of question. It's going to be about your past or it's going to be about your future. So there's only two time zones and they usually come in one of these three varieties. Any type of question they can ask. Now, I have a video on my YouTube channel as well on the, th the three types of interview questions and how to answer them. So if you want more on this Check that out. Now what I'd like to do is I'd actually like to take a peek at what some of the favorite moments are. Uh, Kara's telling me people like structuring the stories, intros in less than a minute, seeing the process through the eyes of the recruiter. I, lo I love that too. I love sharing that part with you. And then uh, Luz Morales, please listen to him. I watched a lot of his content and followed his advice. Now I have the work I dreamed of. And then the example, selecting stories, uh, checking LinkedIn for clues about companies. Those, that was a good one too. So, all right, so that was, that, was, that was Tuesday and Wednesday. So it's a session one and session two. But now what I wanna do is I actually actually want to run through these very quickly, but there are 11 different buckets, uh, kind of, so those are the formats, behavioral, project, and situational, but there's buckets of question types that generally fall in certain what I would call categories of questioning. I think there's 11, give or take. We can, we can, you know, we can quibble about whether there's 10 or 12 or 15, but generally speaking, you're going to get questions that fall into these groupings. And what I want to do with these groupings is I want to give you ideas of how to think about what it is to say. All right, now the first one, I call these the out of the gators. But basically, some of the first questions you should get in an interview are, why are you open to leaving your current job? Why did you leave your current job? Why are you looking? Those kinds of things. Why do you want to come here? Why us? 
right? So why are you open to moving? Why did you choose us? Or why would you? What value can you bring? And how will you benefit? Now, these you got to have ready. Now, one of the things that I want to show you is we've been giving this away every single day. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time with the tactics. I just want you to be ready. These are standard operating procedure and should be asked in some format by every employer. They ask these, they that's a good sign, right? They they should want to know this and you should be ready to do this. And if you if you haven't grabbed this yet, I have this booklet that we've been giving away for six years that I created and I formatted my 14 favorite uh, job interview questions. But what I what I did is I put the, the, the question up in the blue section. I showed you some alternate versions on the left. I, I taught you about what the employer was evaluating. And then I talked a little bit more about the philosophy. And then I gave you some sample responses. So you can see so some of these out of the gators that I just talked about. If you grab this booklet, this booklet is free. And so you can grab it. Uh, you know, it's uh, Stacy's pinned it in the in the chat. If you if you if you're interested in this, you can grab that free booklet because I've taken a chapter out of my interview intervention book. It's my silver bullet interview chapter where I identified the 14 most effective job interview questions that you can be asked. 43 variations of those questions, as you could saw the alternate versions, what the employer is evaluating, why why basically why they're asking it, and some of the best ways to approach it and example responses. Now, that's a chapter that I peeled out of my interview intervention book and I'm, I'm giving, giving that away for free. If you want the interview intervention book, the whole book, we have a book package where you can grab the hardcover. The $30 hardcover is, is $7. You get the $30 hardcover, you get the $9 ebook, you get the audio book that's not even for sale and you get a bunch of other bonuses with it too. So you could go that route if you wanna chip in a few bucks. Maybe Stacy can drop, somebody already dropped that uh oh, actually stacy could you drop the interview book uh offer the free book offer for seven uh seven bucks uh you know don't don't laugh at that expression but basically i'm, I'm looking to recover some of the fees for the services the envelopes and wherever but i'll send it to you anywhere you want in the world but gotta know the out of the gators now there's a couple of other out of the gators that employers love to ask you i call them the lazy two because it requires no thought on their part. They're turning over control of the interview to you. It isn't a great way for them to run an interview because it leaves you to your own devices to talk about whatever you want to talk about. And the goal of the interviewer is to get information to, that they need to ascertain in order to make a determination about whether you are a good fit for their company or not. If you're wandering all over the place when they ask you things like, tell me about yourself or walk me through your resume, the one thing that I want to say about these two types of questions that I want you to be ready for are number one, a great place to start is on the first session of this free workshop where I talked about how to introduce yourself. I also have a video on each of these on my YouTube channel. Tell me about yourself, how, the best response for that, and walk me through the, your resume, the best response for that. You can go watch those if you'd like, but the one point I want to make about this is when you are walking them through you, you want to make sure you are emphasizing their gaps and their problems and how you would solve them. The fact that you have solved them, the fact that you can solve them, the fact that you love solving them, the fact that you wake up, you go to sleep at night thinking about their problems, you wake up thinking about those problems all day long, you solve those problems. That's the way you want to tell these stories. So I've given you the exact scripts for these two as well. Those are the early ones. Now, there's another one that I, 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 don't, I don't love um, where they ask you to look into the future and they want you to play Nostradamus. <clears throat> you know, what, where do you see yourself in five years? What's the first act you will perform when you get here? What will be your greatest accomplishment if you worked here? What would be your greatest accomplishment in three years? And they're asking you to project into the future. Now, the first act is about what you know about their problem and what's gonna give them the greatest ROI immediately. That's what you wanna concentrate on. So whatever their problems are that you notice, you'd say, I would dive right in and focus on this. When you look at the five-year question, 
I've put a video out there, wouldn't you know, on my YouTube channel. And the thing that you want to stress in the five-year question is about the trajectory that you will be on. Most people fall victim to this question because the question is designed with the where word in it. Where do you see yourself in five years, which, Im which implies that they're looking for an answer as a spot and a moment in time. And what you naturally want to do is you, you tend to, to want to focus at a moment in time in the future about what you'll be called or what you'll be doing specifically. I expect that I would be a senior system engineer by then. I would expect... so. That's not the way to go about it, big mistake. What you want to talk about is, is think about the trajectory and who you want to be in five years. In five years, I would imagine I would be somebody who's focusing on building large this, supporting you in that, and talk about what it is you'll be doing in relation to who it is you will be at that time, not what you will be called or what function you'll have. Talk in general capacities. I've got a whole video out on my YouTube channel about this. I even lay it out. I lay out a script for you too. So there's the Nostradamus questions. I want you to go into the future. You got to be ready with those. Then you've often got the conflicts, right? How would you handle a disagreement with a coworker? Well, tell me about a time when you satisfied a difficult teammate, a difficult customer, a demanding boss, or whatever. And in these situations, the inclination is for you to immediately start telling a story about how you, how you influenced somebody to see your way. That's not what I want you to do. The first thing you want to stress here in these situations is you want to talk about your philosophy. And your philosophy is, I'm open-minded. So whenever I have a disagreement with somebody, I'm ultimately wondering maybe they're seeing something that I don't maybe they know something I don't I the only way for me to grow as an individual would be to listen to the views of others learn from them and then see what their viewpoint is and try to try to evaluate it from their vantage point and then so be open minded then I would listen to what they had to say then my first inclination will be why does it have to be either or is there a way as teammates we could make it better generally when you disagree with a teammate uh, it's it's usually about uh, an approach that you want to use to solve a goal. That happens in 90% of the cases, and that's where most disagreements occur. It's just like accidents that happen within one mile of the house. Most disagreements at work happen to be with coworkers about the approach that you want to take. So whenever that happens, I always look for, is there an and option instead of an or option? So there was this time when. So you always, you want to make sure, especially when it's a negative question like this, that you're giving them your philosophy about what a well-adjusted human being you are, okay? So the conflicts ones, those, that's number four. And then number five is general, vague, random organization questions. Tell me about a time when you organized something. Tell me about a time when you brought order out of chaos. I hate these questions. They're silly but no matter what you respond to, if you have to pull an example out of the sky, first order of business is you want to try to organize and show them you brought order from chaos to a problem that what is related to what they do. But no matter who you are, no matter what level you are, if you get a question like this, and even if you don't get a question like this, so the junior people are going to get vague questions that say, tell me about a time you organize something. The senior people aren't going to get a question like that. They're going to get a question like, how are you going to build the, the sales team? How are you going to piece together the marketing team? That's still an organization question. So you want to make sure that you're talking in sequences and, and you're laying out certain pillars that go along with organizing something. What are they? So, for example, maybe you're a college student and you don't, I haven't organized anything, right? I do my school assignments. Or I'm a junior, you know, I'm 25 years old, I'm a junior engineer and I'm constantly organizing it, but I don't really think about it and reverse engineer it in a manner that I'm going to answer a question that way. Well, it's you always want to start with, Oh, well, I organized this problem. I organized this issue just like I would organize any issue. The first part of organization is inventorying what needs to be organized, number one. Second thing is, in order to organize it, you need to assemble or prioritize it. Right, okay, that's conceptually what you would do. In order to prioritize it, you need what? Prioritization criteria. 
what takes precedent? What's more important? So I, I, I figure out what the criteria is. Then based on what I'm going to inventory, based on what the criteria is, then I go into organization mode. I place it where it goes. I sequence it where it goes. I troubleshoot it the way it should be or whatever. And then I actually lay it out, right? I blueprint it. And then what? And then I do it. There it is. And organization. That's what you do. Those four steps, right? I have a playbook a la yesterday's lesson for organizing anything, right? So, so that's ultimately what you want to say. So whatever example it is that you give, if you, if you give them the pillars, you'll be okay. All right. That's number five. Number six, negative Nellies. Anything you would not do? Tell me about a weakness. Blah, 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 blah. Okay. Anything I wouldn't do with the, if, if, if they, if they, you actually get this question, your automatic response is, I would not do anything illegal. Okay. That's the answer to that one. Uh, anything else that's negative, you always want to do it by omission. Well, I wouldn't want to work for a company that didn't do this kind of thing. All right. So every time you get pinned into a corner and they ask you something negative, never make them errors of commission. You want them to be errors of omission. I have yet to do that. This is something I, it's a weakness because I've yet to get enough experience in implementing this. Get the idea. Omissions first. And I want to carry the omissions concept through, through a number of these. What would you miss about your current company? job, so on and so forth. What you don't want to do is you don't want to pick anything that they could be missing themselves, meaning your future employer. So you always want to pick the one of a kinds. What's a one of a kind? People. I'm going to miss the people, right? Because my people over there are not going to be working over there. No one takes offense to that, right? I might miss my customers that I've been spending a lot of time servicing. They're really great people. They invite me to the family parties, those kind of things. You want to miss the one of a kinds where you run zero, zero risk that that employer has a gap. Because if you're going to miss something that that employer cannot satiate, that's really bad. You're going to lose points. Okay, one of a kinds. And then number eight, any regrets. Okay, I did this a while ago, regrets. I love We're the Millers, and uh, I, I love that joke about, you know, don't you have any regrets, and the guy's got regrets tattooed across his chest, and he's got regrets spelled with an A, and uh, <laughs> it's just not even one letter. So I always think about what I think about regrets. It's take backs, do-overs. Is there anything you wish you did not do? Again, the big O, omission. So you do not regret Actually, this is a life lesson here. You do not regret anything you've done in your life. You're going to regret things you didn't do. I wish I would have. I wish I would have contacted you sooner. That's my regret, right? I wish I, I would have. Get comfortable with that. So if you have any regrets, you want to make it a regret of omission, something you did not do that you wish you would have done, you wish you would have done sooner, you wish you would have taken a chance, you wish you would have done something you did not do. And now you know you're going to do it kind of thing. All right, so those are the, re the regrets, number eight. Number nine, the deal breakers. Any reason you would not take this job, omissions again. I would not take this job if I felt that the, cust that the company was not obsessed with customer service. I would not take this job if I didn't feel like the team was committed to right making this a world-class organization or get get getting to be the number one uh, leader in the market or whatever. It's omissions. Any reason you wouldn't take the job. You, it's positive for you, right? You turned a negative question into a positive, meaning I'm so customer service focused that if I find out you're not, then I'm not joining. Okay, something like that. You don't want to go down the path of, well, you know, if you lied to me or, oh, if, if I get in and all of a sudden you change the job description on me, stay away from all that stuff. Okay, then you got the, the failures. 
Tell me about the biggest mistake you made. Tell me about when something went wrong. Tell me about a time you, you know, epically failed. All they're looking for is it's okay to talk about a mistake. They're not looking for, have you never made a mistake? We all make a mistake. I make mistakes every day, literally every day, every day. And so they're just looking for, do you have a good attitude? Do you have a good outlook? And what are you going to look forward to that you that something new has come out of the mistake? So you want the mistake to be valuable and there's a lesson in it. So there was this time when, so anytime I, I, I'm, I'm a fan of failure, right? I know that failure is a sign that I gave it a go. If I made a mistake or something went wrong, then I'm going to learn from it. I think that's great. The only way to actually get better is cliche, cliche as it sounds. You got to get out of your comfort zone. When you do that or when you try new things, you're going to break stuff. Okay, so... When I, when I approach things that way, I always remember life happens for me, not to me. I always try, I would rather, I would rather be aggressive. I would rather take chances. I would rather try new things. And when they don't work out, we look at what went wrong. We fix it. We learn from it and so on. So all, all you're doing is, is you want to make sure you have a great attitude in the way in which you tell us. I do have videos on this one too, on the, on the YouTube channel. And then what I called, you know, not nearly Sophie choice, but things like, would you rather work for yourself or in a team or a cut, you know, or do you, pref- you know, would you, it, would you prioritize your customer over your teammates or something like that? Whenever you get into these situations, turn their or question into an and question. First thing I would do is I would look for, is there a way that I can satisfy both? That's my first inclination. I don't believe that I automatically have to give up one or the other. Yes, I understand that there's limited times in the day, but so whenever you're given an or situation, first inclination is I want to turn it into an and, not an or. All right, so when you think about these 11 uh, groupings, uh, you want to make sure that you are that you were thinking of them in those terms. And then from a how to tell the story standpoint, I wanna talk about that now. I wanna give you a simple tip. Uh, I've, been, I've been hitting this one pretty hard over the, the, the past several weeks. When you think about whether it's a, um, you know, and I talked early about <clears throat> these three types of questions, right? The behavioral, the project specific, or the project specific, and the situational. Regardless, I have formulas for each of those. There's a similar backbone uh, to 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 all three of them uh, that you would use. But one one simple way that I want you to consider this is, I drew this little. Actually, the boot campers saw this yesterday. But I want you to think about your storytelling like a car. Okay. I and by the way, it did. Yes, only take me one take to get there. <laughs> Get the flag done. Um, what's the context? What's the approach? And what what's the result that actually happened? And the context up here, a lot of people, when we role play in my, my one-on-one sessions, th- their inclination is to just start the story and then just start, you know, first this, then that, then that, then that. But I don't really have an understanding of how important this project was, why you were called, what what you were trying to accomplish, what damage would have occurred had you not attained your goal. And so what I want you to do is every single time that you get asked a question, I want you to take just a few seconds to lay the groundwork for why this was so important. That's goal number one. And then goal number two is I want you to foreshadow what the results are that you attained. So what do I mean by that? Let me give you an example. So um, Andy, I see you are a project manager and you implemented this you know, customer relationship system that took you and your team eight months to implement. Can you walk me through that project, right? You get questions like that. And a lot of people would say, okay, well, the first thing I did was this. When the first thing that I want you to say is, oh, that's a great question. You know, the reason this was such a critical project is because we were addressing the CRM system because our call, our customer service was so horrible that our customers, we were losing customers because they, we, they couldn't get through to the call center. And when they got through the call center, the call center reps couldn't figure out what information they needed. They couldn't get it quickly. So our whole times were were up, our response times were slow, and we weren't able to keep customers on, also to upsell them on 
all the things and services that we offer. We were losing 80, you know, eight, eight out of 10 customers every three months. It was a huge problem. Okay, now, okay, that's serious, right? Or we were losing a million a month or we were whatever. Or, or attrition rate was 80% when a normal attrition rate should be less than 10% something like that. So I was called in to implement. Okay, so now what you told them is, this was really important. There was a serious problem. They called you because you're awesome and you already told them, basically they're gonna assume that you put a system in that fixed that. I already, I already know what the results are gonna be. You're gonna, you, everything, the call times went down, the information was more accessible and so on. And then what you do is you walk them through your approach. So like any customer implementation that was IT related. I did the seven things that you would always do for any project that was of this size. The project was, you know, a million five. We had 20 resources. And the first thing that I did was this, the second this, third this, right? I got with the stakeholders. We made sure we understood what the goals were. We architected it. We designed it. We implemented it. We tested it. We integrated, we integrated it and we turned it on, right? Kind of thing. And then you walk them through each, each step and then you say, and when we were done, when we turned the system on, we noticed in the first month that the call center, uh, the call center times were dropping precipitously. Immediately, they dropped fifty percent in the first month. And what ultimately happened was, after six months, we were able to level off, and our customer turnover rate was back below below ten percent. The, the solution was a raging success, and so on. So that's the way you actually tell a story. All right, and you give them you give them a reason why they need to continue to listen to you. You got to capture and keep their attention. It's easier to keep their attention when you draw them a map of what your story looks like. If you just start talking, you ever have a conversation with a friend, your friend starts talking and then they're just babbling and you're wondering what the, why the hell are you telling me this or where are you going with this or why is this important or am I supposed to remember every single detail of everything you're telling me right now? No, but when you when you get in with an, uh, with a, with an employer and they ask you something, what you do is you, you told them why it was important. So this is why you wanna listen to me and this is why it mattered. And, and this here is the map of, the, of what I'm about to tell you, not to mention the framework of what I went through. So I come with a playbook and I let you know what happened as a res the results or the outcome, what happened as a result of me doing what I did, which is what you want on the resume and what you want in the storytelling. All right, so you, know, you can use this little card technique or call it whatever you want or remember Andy's cool you know, uh, uh, racing flag or whatever. But that's how you need to approach each of the stories that you tell, whether it's behavioral, project specific, or even situationals, okay? But in situationals, you're gonna spend a lot of time in the approach section, right? Because, you know, they're, they're, we understand why they asked you, right? There must be some important problem, but, and, you, and you haven't attained any results because it's, it's, a, it's a fictitious future situation, okay? All right, wait, so if, okay, now I wanna shift, I wanna get into a case study now. All right, wait, if you are loving this, make sure to click the like button, make sure you subscribe. Okay, uh, I wanna switch over. How are we doing so far? Everything's quiet. I, I, everything's quiet. It makes me worry a little bit. I, I usually like a little more noise during my live shows. Okay, uh, let's get into the PowerPoint. So there was this uh, boot camper. Her name's Olivia. She's pretty awesome. I think, I think, all my boot campers are awesome. To be honest with you, they are. I wish you guys. I wish y'all could see you the way I see you. Uh, you know, it's it's really it's really it's really special for me. And um, you know, Olivia came you know came to the boot camp recently. Wanted to get together with me because you know she was starting to go through the program. She's interviewing, and here's the here's the situation. She's a she's a senior um, um, project manager, and this organization, this global organization, was looking for a for a senior. Uh, ITPM. She had already met with an external recruiter who put her in front of the hirer, uh, internal recruiter, hirer, and, and, and CIO, I believe. And what, what happened was she went to this interview. She didn't feel like her stories were sharp. She didn't feel like she scored super well. Um, she also was a bit confused because there was a dis disconnect between what the interviewer 
uh, sorry, what the re executive recruiter told her she was interviewing for and what the what the hirer and CIO thought they were interviewing her for. There was a there was a disconnect. It was a hot it was a it was a hot mess. And then to make matters worse, uh, she wasn't sure which stories to tell. And this was exacerbated by the fact that they were asking her these random questions that weren't completely dialed up, didn't give her enough specifics about where she should take her story, and she wasn't really sure. And she said and they were asking her kind of random you know behavioral questions and even just some random questions like well you know how would you handle a backlog a backlog of what you know kind of things and so 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 she and I got together and I, I said okay send me so when I do these one-on-one -on -one sessions what I what I have the folks do is I have them send me their resume if they're if they're getting uh, help from me for interviewing prep I have them send me the company send me the job description send me any storyboards if they have sample answers that they've worked on or notes or anything that they want they send me their criteria what's important to them and so on so I looked at what the JD said and the, the things that I want you to notice over these next couple of pages are how I look at it a, a JD. Uh, call, you could call this the Andy heat map if you want. So when I look at a JD, I see it differently than other people, right? You know, some people, they look at they look at the song sheet, all they, they see are the notes, I hear the music. And I know I know where to look and I want, I want to show you, before we get into the here's how for Olivia, what is it that's important when you look at a JD? So okay, so they need a project manager and they'd like 10 years. Uh, it's IT enterprise apps, it's HR primary function with a SaaS. Okay, those are all unique components. Why do I want to know that? Because those are going to be elements she's going to have to address in her storytelling. It's a global, she's, they're looking for somebody who has global experience in high tech companies. So have you worked for an international organization? Have you implemented international solutions? And have you done that for technology organizations? Okay, let's just, right now all we're doing is what? Hey, we're organizing, right? We're inventorying. What do we got to cover here? Uh, now, when you see things like demonstrable results in delivering modern blah, 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 this is the employer version of word vomit that means nothing, but I noticed they put the word adoption in there, which means they, it's very important to them that if they're implementing an IT solution that they want people to use it. I mean, they could have just said user adoption. That's all I would need to know in a, in, a, in a JD. Again, demonstrable experience leading. Customization. Okay, so you're going to need to be able to customize the solution and you're going to need to be able to integrate it. Okay, so far so good. Nothing out of the ordinary. Knowledge of IT compliance. Okay, that's a component I need knowledge, working knowledge of. Data security, cybersecurity, privacy, and Chinese. They called out Chinese because the headquarters is in China. Now, uh, that's that's a that's a you know a, a preferred but not required. But you know that the organization would love to have that. They cannot require that because what? That's discrimination, right? And then bachelor's degree, which I glossed over. Uh, project manage overseas HCM human capital management. Okay, so now here's what you're going to be doing. All right, agile standardized agile waterfall. That's what that's code for. That's what we want you to be able to do. That's the approach we want you to take. SaaS adoption, right? I get it. Global rollout, fine. Up, oh, same thing, right? It's international across uh, different regions within the world. Uh, analytics and metrics. So I need to know that you come with strong monitoring ability to make sure that the project is on time, on budget. You know what earned versus burned is. You know how to track it, adjust, and so on. So you have to have dashboarding skills. You have to know what to look for and how to make adjustments. All right, great. And continuous improvement. All right, so once you get it up and running, you need to be able to monitor it, right? Okay, so now let's strip it all out. What does it look like? Give me 10. Give me 10 as a PM. HR, HCM functions, cool. High tech companies, have you worked for? Have you been global? Do you understand new implementations of HCM solutions from scratch? This is what they were doing. All right, so they were implementing a solution from nothing. Ground floor stuff. SaaS adoption. Adoption's code for change management. What are the method, methods you've used? Continuous improvement. Have you done maintenance? Okay, well, she had nine years of total work experience total so not all of that was pming but let's be generous and give her seven all right so i'm, I'm a little light 
I understand human capital management because I do that at my current technology company, but I've not implemented it. I just maintain the system. Okay, so that's not great, but it's not terrible because you got working knowledge of the functions. Uh, high tech companies, I would call them close enough. Uh, global, uh, not hugely large, but she is Asian. So, and she understands the culture. And I, I actually, I wasn't even sure. She might even probably speak the language. Um, uh, she has done new implementations, but not HCM like they wanted. There were some other things that were loosely connected. SaaS adoption, so she, she understands how to help implement it and get it you know, ingrained with the user base, but not on a large scale. Her methodology was, was very, very good. And she had continuous improvement because she currently was maintaining her company's HCM system. So that like little maintenance, bugs, little fixes, and those kind of things. So we had uh, some gaps here. Now, there were years of experience gap. There was the size of project gap. There was the impact level. Now, I want y'all to stare at that for a second. I said to her, this job should be a layup for you because on paper, I would take that list all day long because she's got the elements of what I need. Now it comes down to what? Storytelling, right? Paperwork is there. That's why she's sitting in front of them. That's why even though she didn't do well, they invited her back for another round. Right. So so when you look at Andy, am I close enough? Should I submit? Um, hey, Andy, I thought I was right there, but I didn't get the job. Your storytelling fell apart. If anybody has this this background against that job description, the way she has it, that job should be yours. You should be counting, the new, counting, the new, counting the new payday, right? Except that let's not be, fri you know, let's not be flip about it, right? You got to go through the interviews and you got to score well. You got to connect with them. You got to make sure that your stories are in alignment with their problems, right? So we we still got some work here to do, even though I think Olivia is a star. All right, so she said, Andy, I want you to help me address the gaps. I need some help with the storytelling. I'd like to tighten my responses because I want to make sure I stay on track. I don't want to fall prey to wandering into areas that are not really important. You know, maybe we can touch on the tell me about yourself. They, they ask me these random questions. I'm not sure, you know, how to siphon it down to know exactly what they're looking for. And how do I handle these vague questions? All right, so I said, okay, this is how I want you to think about it, and this is where the ROI comes in. This is where you, this is where, uh, you know, I earn my money. You've got to determine what the most important skills are, what is actually truly required. So we went back. Now, I would say in this case that you need large-scale project management experience for IT solutions. If you have some knowledge of capital, human capital solutions, that's good too. Global is important, especially because for uh, somebody who's working in the U.S., when you start working globally, whether in Asia or anywhere, doesn't make any difference. The cultures are different. You need to understand what those cultural ch differences are because that is going to permeate through the way in which you run the project, the way in which you interact with them, and all that good stuff. And, ev and every country's got different standards. It's, it's, it's important that you have that. So, in my opinion, she had all that. She did. She really did. Um, she had to get her primary story in order. So, when I say primary story, if you are a marketer and you're going to digital marketing, you're going to go in and you're going to you're going to interview. If you are a project manager and you go in and you're going to interview. If you're a technologist and you're going to go in and interview, you can run an entire interview on one story. You need one bread and butter story that is analogous to what it is they do. Now, you might say, well, Andy, hang on, I, I haven't done exactly what I'm you know, going over there to do. Number one, that's the point I want to learn. Yeah, it is, but you got to sell yourself into there first. And, and with your one story, they're going to notice that what you're telling them is just like what they need you to do. That's the, that's the big deal part except that she didn't have a super clean story. 
because she didn't have anything that looked exactly like what they were looking for. And then the offshoots are sub stories. So we have to get them in order and it's a lot less for you to remember. And then how do you harden up the soft questions? And if you have to harden up the soft questions, like when they say things to me like, well, how would you handle the backlog? You need to say, okay, I would handle the backlog based on what's in the backlog. So in the backlog could be Right, new enhancements, version two, right? Uh, bug fixes, r wish list stuff, and so on. And so, here's how I would do that. Is there, are you talking about, if, if you wanna talk about a backlog, then we're gonna talk maintenance. If you wanna talk about future enhancements, we're gonna talk about new rollouts. So, so, so basically, she's gonna harden it up so she knows where to go with the response, and she knows all the variations of what it could be, and you have to anticipate that because anybody who was experienced enough would know that. And so you immediately go back and you harden it up for them. So these are the things that we, that we needed to work on with her. And then here's what she had. I said, now, when I get into one-on-one -on -one interviews, sorry, one-on-one -on -one coaching sessions with people, I look at their job descriptions. This is for interview prep when I prep somebody. And I look at the, so I had an advanced look at what she sent me. I looked at it and I knew exactly what she needed. I didn't know what she had other than the resume I was looking at. So when she and I got together, I said to her, okay, what, is, what do you have related to human capital management, large project implementations, global, SaaS, right? I, I ticked it off for her. What's the story? She said, well, uh, I maintain the HCM system now. Okay, that's not, that's not close enough. You maintain it, that's fine. That checks off the knowledge of the functions. She says, well, I implemented this eight week, impl or I implemented this reference checking system that we needed to put in place because we had no way to uh, handle reference checking, manage reference checking and all that good stuff. And I said, okay, how long was it? She says, two months. I said, okay, that's not long enough. What else do you have? She said, well, I did this almost year long, I think it was, a uh, security project where we had some um, issues with, you know, hundred, hundreds of users that were using the H, uh, a system. And this was a security-based approach. Uh, I think we needed to make sure we were HIPAA compliant, who had access to what, and it, it was a fairly complicated solution. It's how long did it take? How many resources were there? So, okay. Now, when I'm working with you, I can say to you, okay, what do you got? And if that doesn't fit, I can start piecing together and asking you, okay, what else? She says, well, I got one of these. Says, Give me that, right? Because we're going to take all this together and we're going to build you a story where you could run the whole interview and you can score all the points you need to off one story and the additional offshoots that you need to include in the storytelling to make it sound like one response. That's your goal. I only need one response. Okay, so here's what here's what I want to here's what I want to share with you. Now, it do, why why just one response? Well, it doesn't matter what their question is, right? How have you done this before? Do you have these skills? What makes you unique? Tell me about a similar project. Any these are all the same question. Tell me about that project there or this project there. Have you implemented an HCM solution before from scratch? No, she hadn't, right? Have you implemented full life? All of these questions are all the same question in the interview. They all have the same response, which is why she doesn't need to package seven different responses. She needed one response that she knew how to tell really well. Okay? And so this is what I want to teach you guys. Uh, you know, I'm constantly looking for new ways to illustrate how to tell stories. Uh, do I have any? Do I have any book writers out there, uh, uh, novelists in particular, or short story writers? Uh, ra raise your raise your hand if I if I do. There's different ways to tell a story. The novelists will know these. I'm an author and I obsess over writing, so uh, these are these are pretty apparent to me. And when you when you are telling a story. It's all about the narrative that you're telling. And there's different ways to tell a narrative to elicit different reactions, emotions, actions, and whatever your goal is for whoever's reading it or hearing it from you. There's linear storytelling. Now, linear storytelling is just like it sounds. It starts in the beginning, it goes to the next step, the next step, the next step, and everything, and all the way from A to Z, and it all happens in time sequence. 
is perfectly linear, okay? So it starts and it finishes, all right? That's it. Now, some of you can tell stories that way, right? I did this project, I started here, I did this, I did this, I did this, I did this, boom, linear. Okay, that's what a lot of you do. And you don't, you're afraid to go off track because you don't want to go all over the place. Except that the best way to tell a story is to fracture it. Now, nonlinear storytelling or nonlinear writing, you've probably seen it, watched it in movies, read it in novels, but a nonlinear story is a story that jumps time or has insertions from other places or has flashbacks, which are different, but other ways where you're using information to illustrate your point. So you've seen a movie, right, where you, you, you see the movie going and then what happens? Oh, 17 years earlier, they're flashing back to what was happening to the character or in the story or whatever it is. Sometimes it jumps forward, sometimes it jumps back, sometimes it jumps out. Okay, that's fracturing a story because you, you need something that happened at a different moment in time to make a point. Or in this case, if it's entertainment, they're just trying to get better emotion out of you. So that's, that's called fracturing. Then there's other things where you can frame a story. This is different than the priming and framing I teach you from uh, moving a person's emotional state and getting them to view something how you want them to view it. Framing a story from a narrative standpoint is a story within a story. So all this stuff is going on and you know the story is I'm sitting around and I'm talking with my buddies and then the story within the story is I'm telling them a story about something else kind of thing. So there's a story within a story or there's another, oop, there's another thing that I would call, and I, I didn't have a proper name for this, but it's really like a curation. So like you Frankenstein it. So you take different pieces of different stories and you curate them together to make it sound like one story. Do you know that I do this to you almost every talk? Right, what did I do yesterday? I gave you six criterion points in a row. What did I do? I pulled three different stories from three different people that have been three different moments in time. And so I curated what I need to illustrate the point I was making in the talk, which I was giving to you in a linear fashion, except from a time perspective, I had to go back in time and grab examples to illustrate the point I needed to make to you right at that moment. Okay, so that's, that. This is these are different ways for you to assemble your interview stories. Okay, so now what I want to, I want to, I want to basically give you an example of what I mean. So you have an understanding of what Olivia was doing. So she said to me, or she asked, should I, you know, which story should I use? And, and now, remember yesterday when I said, well, you know, relevancy is better than recency, except she didn't, she had some relevancy that she was maintaining a system with HCM. She also had a recent story where she did that eight-week implementation, except complexity trumps both of these if you can check off most of the skill sets that the employer needs. So complexity in her story about the security and the user permissions and the user base to get them dialed in is going to trump everything. And so I had to teach her how to fracture that story to get all the elements that she needed to to show them that she had all the requirements that they needed. They just didn't all fit nicely into one project. So what we did was I said to her, all right, I want you to go with the more complicated project that was bigger. It was global, so that's good. It is somewhat related because there were some security issues, some HIPAA issues, some other things that you were overcoming. Okay, so context, approach, we're going to fracture the approach, and then we're going to tell them about what happened. So context, you don't just start with, I have this story, it's about security, right? You start with what? There was this problem, we were out of compliance with HIPAA laws, we had all of these users, we didn't have the proper security settings, we didn't have the proper user roles, we had people with access to places, we were violating these laws, we had all kinds of problems. Right. Okay, that's the con, there's a real problem here. Okay, so this needs to be implemented. So I was put in charge. Now when I was put in charge, a significant portion of this project was thinking about what the role were gonna be, how to, how to assemble it, uh, we had to match it with the laws and all this other stuff. Great. 
except that that's not exactly what you're going to do when you implement this HCM, this more of an operational system. So that's okay. So you give them the context. You tell them what you did. You give them the whole year and all the stages. So she did that. Then when you go into the body, when you get into the approach, when you get into the approach here and you take them through the steps, you go linear. You say, I did this first. Then I did this second. And when I got to the second piece, there was uh, this, this requirements phase that we had to go through. Now you're going to give them the detail, and then you're going to fracture the story, and you're going to tell them how they would have to do this in their environment for exactly what they need to do and why you know that to be the case. So here's what I did. And, but this is analogous to, take them to the future, in your environment when you implement an HCM system, the requirements gathering is going to be a little different because, and I know that because, jump back in time, because when I'm working in, in a maintenance mode and we do these mini cycles, this is the way we have to do it and this is the most effective way. So that's what we would do in the future. That's how you fracture a story. Okay, and then you keep going. So just so you understand, that's what you would have to look forward to if I was to run this project. I took them into the future. I brought them back to the present in the story. And then she went on, finishes it out. So when we test it, most of this is going to be tested this way, except that when we test your system, there's going to need to be more elegant script writing. We're going to need to use a tool. We're going to, boom. Why do you know that? Because every time we do something this complicated where there's a lot of customization to the system, we have to do it this way. That wasn't part of her story. She's telling them that's what they're going to have to do. Well, all of a sudden, this sounds like somebody who has a methodology and is pulling all the pieces. You know there was this time where I encountered this problem. I didn't encounter this. You'll encounter this problem. I didn't encounter this problem. But back in 1999, this happened kind of thing. So that's fracturing a story to make it sound like one story. These are you are not running off at the mouth because you're doing it very quickly. You're just you're just inserting points for a couple of reasons. Number 1, you're giving them a better illustration of what their life is likely to be like when they take the project on. You're giving them assurances that you know what to anticipate and how you would handle it. You're validating it with where in your life I Frankensteined it. I just pulled a piece, I pulled the arm over from that and I attached it right there and I built it and it all sounds cohesive because what's the goal of your story? To show them that you know what you're doing and the value you're going to contribute and why you're qualified to do it. Right? So that's how she has to had to piece it together. Who's tracking with me? I know this sounds complicated, but when you think about it, if you there's steps to this, right? What is it that they want? What is it that I have? What's my most analogous story? How do I fill in the gaps inside the story I want to tell them or am likely to tell them? And how do I build it and make it one? And that's how you do that. And you think about it, and it's just three steps. And most of where you would fracture the story is in the approach. Well, I did this first. I did this second. I did this third. And then just take what you need and drop it into where it is because you, you need to push them into their environment. Right, so you're not you're not using the whole stop after the story's done and then do you have an exam? No, she knows what their problem is. She knows why they're interviewing her. She knows the system that that she's going to need to implement. Well, we got that straight, right? She knows the system that they're going to need to implement. So I, uh, I I I hope that helps you understand. So when you're looking at this line, so like interview intervention, that's linear except what when I fracture it when I tell you stories. When I do things like, there was this guy, his name was Michael, boom, 2007. There, there was this guy, his name was Andy, and in 2003, if somebody would have told him he's going to be a recruiter in 2004, he would have laughed, he would have laughed you out of the room, right? Kind of thing. That's a, that's, a, that's a fracture. Now, it's way better if you're telling entertaining stories, but you can use those techniques. I'm telling you it's okay to pull things in from other stories when they are contextually important. And you need them to sell yourself, and you're doing this for illustrative purposes. The goal for you is not to tell a story from A to Z. The goal for you is to get a job. The fastest way to do that is to make sure that they can see you have all the skills that you need. Okay? So, who's tracking with me? Linear, nonlinear, fractured, Frankenstein. If you hear any other career coach talking like this, you know they copied it from me. I have to keep making names and stuff up so that I can I can make sure that I'm out in front of everybody and that you guys are getting it first and best. Okay, 
if you, okay, I, I, I promised myself I was getting this done within an hour. It's 11.58, so I'm just stopping right now. Uh, you're you're done on this, okay? So you 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 got the goods here. If you enjoyed that, click the thumbs up. If you're watching this on the recording, I hope you enjoyed it. Kind of a mini little webinar, well, mini for Andy, but an hour long webinar on on how to think through, how to answer any kind of interview question. I gave you references to a whole bunch of other assets that are free, or you can join in my job search coaching program, my premium program. If you'd like, if you're watching this on the recording, I'll see you next week. If you're here with me now, uh, we're going to go to the chat. I want to uh, take a sip of tea and I want to give you a few minutes on my boot camp. And uh, I know I talked about it a little yesterday. Okay. Uh, who liked who liked that? Who, who I mean, <laughs> who liked that last piece? Because I, I'm trying to think of different ways. To, now, it's easy when I'm with you. It's just you and me, and I can say, I don't know, get rid of that. What, give me what else you got. Right? I, can't, I can't do that in a video I create and just say, boom, 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 boom. But when I'm with you, and now, so I'm not going to be with you all, right? So when you're by yourself, what do I have? What's, like, inventory it. What do I got? What, what can I leverage? What, what's, what, are they, what problems are they going to have? Well, I didn't, I didn't have that exactly in that. But can I can I make a reference to that? You got this. All right. Uh, let's see. It's noon. I'm gonna just spend a quick five minutes tell you about the boot camp, and then we're gonna go into Q and A at one o'clock today. So one o'clock. So I've, we've got an hour. Uh, I'm going to be getting together again with members of my job search coaching program. If you would like to join us, it's a, a my premium signature program. Now, yesterday, if you were with me, I gave you some slides and I just talked about the different uh, uh, areas of the job search and how the program would work for you and all that good stuff. Today, I just want to show you where to check out uh, the page and my illustrious team who is totally on their game has already posted the the coaching program link and let me just very quickly show you uh, where you can find more information on this uh, here we go so this is the coaching page you've got four days this promotion lasts and it's the last promotion we will be offering this kind of discount too. So uh, for uh, members of, of the program who are already in it, you all you all have what's called the interactive package unless you are also already a VIP. But this interactive package is literally half off the 500 bucks. It's a fantastic program. It's five years old, this program is. It's broken up into five modules. Uh, five base modules. There's a lot of additional assets. It's got the tools and templates. No matter what package you enroll in, it's, it comes with lifetime access, uh, lifetime access, and members of the interactive and the VIP packages get this online support. Everybody gets lifetime access, and they also members of this pa of these packages get the lifetime. Uh, live group coaching support, which is what we do every month. We get together at least one time, sometimes twice or three times, and sometimes four or five times. Uh, this month, we're meeting three days in a row because Andy has jury duty, and he wanted to make sure he got his June sessions in with, with his team of boot campers. Uh, as I mentioned yesterday, we talk about getting you in a ready position, finding the right job, finding the right career path, finding the right direction based on what drives you and what you need your requirements we get this all in order and your requirements are your best defense against making poor decisions what is it that I need how is it that I should evaluate it what questions should I be asking an employer and how can I triangulate whether this is a good employer for me then there's marketing so that's resume writing cover letters uh, LinkedIn profile, personal branding. I've added some other things in here. I probably ought to update the page a little bit. Uh, the job searching. So how do you actually job search? So how do I bring myself to market? 
Applying for jobs is not job searching. I don't want you to apply for jobs. That's shoving your resume into the applicant trashing system. It's not a great way to find your job. Yes, some of you will find your job that way. Some of you will be required to put it into those employers' systems. But that's not really the most effective way to get people uh, to open up and give you interviews. So I teach you all of that. Uh, everything you want to know about interviewing. So you got a taste of some of my tactics this week. I wrote a book on interviewing. I'm not going to say a whole lot more about that. I think you get it. And negotiation isn't just about a one-time conversation. What is it that you need to do every step of the way to make sure that you get paid the maximum amount when it is time to get that offer, which you will do because you're going to do all the other four things. So what is it? Now, you, you can look inside. There's a see inside program. There's all these nice testimonials from all these wonderful people. There's a whole bunch of other things. I got some questions yesterday about career changing. Uh, take comfort in knowing uh, there are uh, all people of all ages, new uh, graduates to people in their 70s. Uh, there's a, quite a few people in their 70s, in fact, that are in the program and, that are getting jobs. And then what we do is we have this live group coaching for the interactive package and VIP members, of which everybody who joins right now will be. Um, we had one yesterday, uh, or two days ago, yesterday, and today we have another one. These are the packages. So this is $6.97 for the self-study. This is what the price is going to be Monday. And you won't get online support and you won't get the live group coaching. This is $9.97. Uh, this expires on Monday as well. Uh, this package here will be a thousand bucks on Monday, but it's basically an outline of everything you get. You get some other point solutions in addition to all the other things. And then the VIP package comes with a complete marketing review, not to mention a number of other things. You do get a one-on-one -on -one coaching session. It's pretty awesome. I do offer resume reviews. I do offer trade-ups. So somebody asked me about this yesterday. If you've if you've already bought something from me that's job search related, that's a training program like the interview intervention course or the resume writing workshop or the job search mini camp, the mini programs or the job search challenge, I sell those separately uh, because sometimes people don't want to pay the $500 or $1,000. Those are less expensive. If you've paid for anything, I will give you full dollar for dollar credit towards your $497. So that's a pretty good, pretty great deal. And then I do have a, 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 a refund. You can use it for a full 30 days. If you trade it back, we, we keep a few bucks for the credit card transactions that we don't keep. There's a whole video out there on questions. If you have any, I'm happy to answer them. I answered some of these yesterday. I don't want to take up any more time. There are loads of videos. There's some reels there. There's me in a black and white picture. I don't know why I settled on black and white. We have a whole page of testimonials, which I showed you, not to mention all the emails that you're getting with snippets of people inside the community and other groups uh, that have sent me an, and, and the entire Mile Walk Academy community, you know, their, their victory dances, but it's a really great program. I encourage you to check out this page. Uh, I always, I like to say, you'll find your job search doppelganger there. There's, I mean, there's a lot of testimonials. There's people with, from all walks of life in zillions of different countries with different kind of goals. I need to close my business up and I want to be a full-time employer. I want to move countries. I've been at my company for 30 years and I'm job searching for the first time. We have all, with people that are unemployed, you have people that are changing careers. So check it out. Um, there's some great lessons too. I've got a number of these 20 minute videos that you can check out. Those are lesson based. They talk about what they did. Uh, so it's, it's, it's really a lot of fun. There's Jamie. I love her. She's I, probably 75 now, uh, but just fan, fantastic stories that warm my heart. I cannot wait to add your face to this page, but you gotta play to win. All right. Well, check that out. If you got any questions, I'm happy to answer them. I think you get the idea. You either want in and you believe in it or you don't. And either way, I love you. It doesn't make any difference to me, but it's there if you want. And it's the last time it's going to be out at this price. So any boot campers that are here that want to share uh, their their experience with me, I uh, I would love to you know, love to see it and, and love for you to share it because it's one thing for me to tell everybody how wonderful the program is, which I, we've poured our hearts and souls into giving it to you um, and, and, and making it the best thing on the planet. I, I, 
I, I got to believe it's the best thing I've ever seen as far as job search coaching stuff. I hope you agree. Okay, uh, let's see. Some story comments. I want to read. Uh, I love to tell Amy Willoughby. I love to tell my story that will answer a ton of their questions quickly and give them a great sense of my work. I love it. Suzanne, tell the stories one at a time and see how often the stories cover several of the categories. If you have one main story, use stories related to the main story. Awesome. That's what I mean. And so, hey, so I will take you back. So remember when I was telling you about this? Okay, well, a part of that was. And then the challenge I encountered was, and there's a number, and you want to work them back to something they're already familiar with, right? And, and, and you'll be able to gauge. They'll love that. Believe me, it's easier for them to remember. Uh, Laura Trucano Hart. Love this. Awesome. Michael Tierney, this is gold. Jerry Gold. <laughs> I'm tracking. Aylin, I've been practicing out loud as you were going along. Good stuff. Awesome. Sarah Miranda, mind blown on this one. I have an interview tomorrow. Go get them, baby. Make me proud. Be that marketer I know you can be. Flavia, love the Frankenstein. And Hawkins bag tracking. Once you have the blueprint, you can do it. Totally. You Remember, folks, when I'm talking about this, that, don't overcomplicate it. Make yourself a story. And what can I use to fill in to illustrate my knowledge or what they would need to know or how they could envision me working there? or what, it, what, what, what value I can contribute by showing them that I would foresee and anticipate that this would be done this way in your environment. That's ultimately what you want to do, right? That's just like taking them into the future. You take them in the future, bring them back. Love it. Okay. Uh, Elian, VDB. Hi, Andy. In the wake of tech layoffs and rescinded offers, is it appropriate to ask about project layoffs in an interview? Yes. Final answer. I would ask, say, hey, look, I um, obviously I'm interested in joining an organization that, um, you know, is is um, is thriving. I'd love to understand, you know, kind of what you feel the future holds, uh, how you've positioned yourself to thrive. What what measures have you taken with two? What measures have you taken Everybody be everybody better damn well write this one down or loop me back. What measures have you taken to ensure you will thrive during these crazy times? That's a specific question. Right? What measures? What have I done? Well, I'm making sure that we're putting a calendar together that we're, we're very consistent. We're going to be present. We're going to make sure that we have a variety of options for people so that you know, depending on what happens, we'll make sure that we're more available if people are getting like, so like what changes do I, okay, these are changes I need to make so that, that I'm here for you all. Well, if you're, you're going to join my team, you're going to know that my walk's not going anywhere, right, kind of thing. And when you are in an interview, you, you ask it forward first. Have you had any situations in the past that you, multi, multi prompts, what measures did you take, okay, have you had any situations in the past that you looked for? I noticed, I read an article in the Wall Street Journal that said you just let go or whatever. How'd that happen? What'd you learn? What measures you put in place so that doesn't happen in the future? Right, and like, how, and then how did you handle that? Meaning like, what mechanically did you do to let people go? Kind of thing. Not only is it appropriate, it's a must right now. You need to be asking that. Actually, Stacy, can you make a note for me? Let's do a whole session on questions that everybody needs to be asking right now because those are different, right? These are, these, are, like, these are questions that I want you asking now, and I think these are important questions. But, uh, I mean, like, there's, every, time you're, every time you're asking a question, you're asking two things. Is this a good company, and is this a good company for me? Right, and now is this a good company is taking on a new complexion as far as your questions are concerned. So I will, I'll get you a whole, I'll, 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 I'll do a whole, a whole shebanger on, on that. That's, that's a great question. M Sport. If you're the type to give long-winded answers, especially if the situation is complex, how would you suggest tightening up your responses to be more succinct? Where's my card? Okay, you'll love this. How about this for a tip inside of a tip? You see this thing right here? If you do this, meaning if you give them the approach the way I described, you will not become verbose. 
So follow me here. The reason you become verbose is what? There's multiple reasons y'all become verbose. Do we know what they are? Your train of thought is it locked in, okay? You did. You started talking and you didn't have the outline of what you were going to say, right? Could you, admit, could you imagine if I was going to come here and just start talking and I didn't have that outline, right, that I gave you? First, we're going to do this. Then we're going to do this. Then I'm going to give you 11 of these. Then I'm going to give you a technique. Then we're going to talk about Olivia. There you go, right? I didn't go, I did not miss one thing I was supposed to tell you and I did not take, I did not spend one minute longer talking and that was an hour talk. You need that for three minutes. So I ran the, I ran this project just like I would run any other project. It has seven things in it. This, 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 and this. You already gave me the outline. You got the outline in your head. You said it out loud. Step one, here's what we did. Step two, here's what we did. Now you will stay in your outline if you, if, right, if you have the outline, it's prepared, and you know the highlights that you need to mention. They will know where you are in the, in the, in the box. We, that's what we want. We want them to know where you are in where, what the map of the story looks like. And that insulates you from straying off. I mean, you got to be focused. But if you're prepped and you know what the outline looks like. So a lot of times when I talk with y'all, uh, if I don't have note cards, I just know there's these six things that I need to tell them in this order. That's it. That's what your the whole interview is for you. Try that. Medina T. Hello, Andy. An interviewer asked me questions about my family's nationality, ethnic background, and what they do. Is it just her being friendly and curious? It felt invasive, invasive and a Europe leader. Yes. Okay, so uh, personally... I, I think that's a little over the top. I, I, it does feel invasive. And here again, I'm only reading it from a, a few characters from you. Now, uh, I, you know, I, I don't know all the European culture uh, and, and what's etiquette and what's appropriate and if that's normal. It, uh, it, I mean, it doesn't sound normal to me, but I, I, that's a little weird. So yes, I agree. I agree with you there. Ian M, do you see specific questions from the 14 most commonly asked in the first and second interviews and others in the third and fourth interviews? I tend to be more animated, detailed on the third and the fourth. So if I had to, Ian, let's do this. Can I, let's just pull this up. All right, so here's the 14. Why would you leave your current employer or why did you leave or so on? I'd ask that right away. Why do you want to join our company? I'd ask it right away. What value do you offer? I'd ask it right away. How will you benefit? I would ask these in the screen. What's the first act you'll perform when you start? I see this with the hiring official. If you were still working here three years, hiring official. Describe a situation where you and a coworker disagreed. This could be in the screen or with, uh, with somebody else. Ambiguous situation. By the way, these are great questions to conceptualize what you think and how you think. They're asked in many different forms, and they can be asked within. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you another trick here in a minute. This one here is probably something I would want the hiring official or tech screen to ask. Situation where something went wrong, a uh, hiring official should ask. Educate yourself. Somebody else could ask this in the screen, but I would want to know how you learn along the way. That's number 10. Coworkers describe you. I love that. So that's our, how self-aware you motivate. That's passion uh, early. Prefer working on a team or by yourself, right? The, the, the Sophie's Choice questions, ideal boss. These are, you know, kind of a mixed, a mixed bag. Here's the best. This is the best. Best interviewer? I want... I want you to all go out and interview and kick ass, get your jobs, and then if an interviewer does this to you, I want you to go back and find that interviewer after you get the job and say, my coach said, you must be a really good interviewer because you did this. Okay, now, I wrote that those questions inside interview intervention because I believe that if you take that suite and the variations and you actually understood how you would respond to those, 
you'll be golden. And then an interviewer would know about 80% of what they needed to know about you. Okay. Now I've been giving it to you this way because it's a little easier to digest, but these six stories could answer all of those 14. Okay. All right. Now here's what a great interviewer does. A great interviewer does not say, tell me about a time you overcame a challenge. Tell me about a time, whatever. Okay. They don't do that at all, ever in the, in an isolated fashion. The best interviewer says, hey, Ian, I see you did this project. Uh, I see you did this project. And, you know, can you walk me through this project? Because this looks just like what we need you to do. Then you start talking. Oh, Andy, that was a great project because we were losing a million a month and this and that, and I needed to patch something before the whole building cratered. Awesome. Take me through it. Well, first thing I did, you know, I did these seven things, boom, boom, boom. First thing I did was this. Second thing I did was that. Hey, Ian, hold on a second. What was the biggest challenge when you hit that second step? Now I get the behavioral question, but I also get a behavioral question inside the context of a story that I care about. So I didn't say, tell me about a time you overcame a challenge. I asked you, tell me how you overcame challenges in that step of that project. Because now I know you're going to give me a relevant story that helps, meaning meaning relevant to me, meaning helps me determine, oh, okay, I see. Okay, that's good. I like the way you responded to that. Now, you can also preempt those. So on your side of the table, you do this. So we hit step two, and it all turned out great. But you know what? Generally, when you hit this step, you encounter three major problems that you have to you have to have in your risk management portfolio. This, this, and this. I know this to be true because I've run a hundred of these projects. And so what we do is we try to preempt them, but it turns out we encountered one of these risks. That's a challenge. That's a risk. You also said I know how to risk manage and so on. So you insert the problem yourself and fix it while you're going. Because you do that. You're going to get points if they if they know that there's going to be a problem. If you're, they're giving you a situational story or whatever, and you're walking through the scenarios or you're telling them about a story you did, especially if you're in a situational story where you're talking about a future scenario and you're giving them your approach, if you get to the spot, and remember, you haven't done this project yet. You, they asked you, what would you do? You said, here's how I would approach it. If you say, oh, uh, oh, well, when you get to this stage, before you go to from two to three, you need to make sure you do all these things because if you don't, you're going to have a whole bunch of problems or you're likely to encounter this problem. Now, if they knew that, fine, you still get points. If they didn't, you're a genius and you're hired, right? So, so the, the best candidates insert their own problems. Check, I got a video out there. Maybe Stacy can in, tell me if I'm right. It's like um, a tip, a sen- it's a, oh, Jesus, senior level tip. Uh, executive level storytelling. Stacy, what? Stacy, what's what's the video? I, I got a whole I got a whole video on this about the tactics you want to employ when you're when you're an executive. But anybody can do this and sound golden. Ian, that's a great question. That is a that is an, a neat little twist on 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 kind of the common questions we get in an interview. And Ernst. Job search program is the bomb for watching during a treadmill workout. <laughs> I love that I could take you through your workouts and engaging information for all the stages of your career search and beyond. Well worth the dollars. I love it. I, and that is so nice of you. Can we, can I put it, can you guys indulge me? Man, I've worked so hard on uh, getting this thing as fun as possible. So let's see. That's Ann. And then Saeed. Boot Camper, great program. Problem is me. I've been jumping around the course depending on where I was on my career seeking journey just buy it and follow the program from start to finish can can i say uh saeed that on this one this is a big deal people who are interviewing they jump in the program and they want to go to the interview module it's no you got to go to module one you screw module one up module four and interviewing you're gonna you're gonna not do well and so, so when you look at the whole blueprint, uh, you're going to have such a better and more commanding understanding. Uh, Michael Tierney, get it now before the cost doubles. Won't regret it. <laughs> and you become part of an amazing, supportive community of job searching peers. Oh, I love this. Hang on. So uh, you you will be you will be surprised 
how um wait can i let me see if i can cover my whole face with these boot campers um you will be surprised at how important the community is you just don't realize job searching is lonely it's long okay i did enough of that i don't want to be obnoxious you guys get the point but it's not thank you to my boot campers and and all my boot campers who are who are uh, are commenting job searching is lonely you don't need to go this alone how much time are you wasting trying to do this on your own i can expedite that but also i have i have an iron man coach i don't i probably don't need her at this point except Training for an Ironman is lonely. It's really lonely <laughs> with my schedule. And I like that somebody is on the other end of this thing in the system sending me cute emojis and crazy texts and other things that just let me know I got this, right? It's the same thing with job searching. And so it's it's just, it's nice to have that community. Gray, sorry, let's get back to some of your questions here. Gray7 what to expect in an initial phone screen? Great, in an initial phone screen, great question. I And it is a great question because, and every phone screen's a little different, but if, if you go back to like what Ian was asking about, are there questions that you would get earlier in the process as opposed to later in the process? In the early phone screen, I wanna say two things. You gotta be able to answer, right? Why are you leaving? Why us? What value you bring, right? Are they're gonna check some boxes? Do you have this? Do you have that? You know, some of that, right? And you're, they're gonna go down that path. They're gonna try to assess culture, that kind of stuff. And then there's a, a video I have out there on I don't know if it's six or eight uh, great questions for you to ask in your interview screen or recruitment screen that you want to make sure that you're asking. And so, so that's that's how I would think through that. Uh, oh, Stacy came through with us. Can we give Stacy a shout out and Kara too for all the craziness that I and that stuff, crazy stuff I make them do? Uh, it's my fa favorite senior level job interview tip is the part about storytelling and then insertions of the problems and how to do that. It you'll, you'll smoke the interview. You do that. That's the that's the video uh, that I was uh, that I was trying to remember. And then uh, let's see, Clint is a boot camper changing careers and lacking direct experience what should i prioritize job searching or becoming more familiar with the position duties making myself a more attractive candidate clint two things number one for you go head into the program and watch the 12 steps that you need to go through to become a career changer i change careers twice i break it down 12 steps, four stages. There's four stages to the process to do it correctly, and there's 12 steps. Now, a big part of making a career change is choosing the right career effectively, and there's a there's a choice involved, and if you choose the right one, you'll then, you know, kind of leap in the net will appear. It won't appear right away, but it will appear. You'll, you'll be able to figure out some of the other things that you need to do as long as you're moving in the right direction. And then I would also look at some of those videos in module one to help you triangulate. Now you asked a specific question here, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna answer it. If I was changing careers, I would, be, I would be prioritizing the research step first. And I would, okay, so you know how I did the case study with Olivia and I showed you the job description. Before you're even looking at job descriptions, from that vantage point, I would be thinking about well, what is it that I want to do, what matches what I want, and I would be using for you, Clint, the criteria questions matrix in the boot camp and in the columns instead of employers. I want you to have careers, okay? So, so because you're gonna, you're you want to evaluate if those careers align to your requirements. So, what am I talking about? You build out your list of requirements. And then what you're gonna do is you're gonna weight those cri criteria, those requirements, what's most important, you know, scale of one to 10. Then what you're gonna do is instead of looking at employers to see which employers satisfy your criteria the closest, you're gonna be looking at which careers satisfy my criteria the closest. That's one of the early stages. In order to do that, you need to become educated on the positions themselves. Meaning it's it, there's some researching that you're gonna have to do. There's some skill sets. You literally can Google, like not to, oversimplify it. If I wanted to become a chef, 
right? You could Google what are the best traits of executive chefs? What are the best characteristics? What are the best skills? And start to start thinking about skill sets that you would need. Is that something you want to do? Do you have to do more of this or that? Do you not like that, that part of the job or whatever? Start looking at, you can look at JDs for researching purposes. Oh, it looks like they do these, these, this. I don't know if I'd like that. Hang on, I really like that. Hang on, that is three or four things I really like. I can live with that other thing. Right, like you're, you're going through that because for you to go and start job searching, what do you need to know? What's my destination or what's like, like, like sort of the neighborhood? Because then what do you do? You don't put your resume together first. You need to have that to job search. You have to figure out where you want to go. Put your resume together that gets you on that route, that gets you there. That's the way I look at that. That's a great question. It really is. Adam Boots, this is helping my own career coaching delivery. Thanks. You're welcome. Especially, we're finding stories where we're, where we've solved the most similar problems than the employer. Yes. Do you use the STAR technique? Uh, not really. Uh, I do have uh, some videos, Adam, on my approach to answering behavioral interview questions. I have the video I referenced uh, about, you know, the three different formats, three different, I can't even barely see this, three types of interview uh, questions and how to answer them. I also have a video on how to answer behavioral interview questions, and, and that, will, that will give you my, my technique. I don't, I, don't, I don't like the star technique because I don't like the S in the star. I don't like, the, I don't like that you start with a situation. I would rather you start with philosophy and a context. Uh, Kara's saying, Andy, there are many, many boot camp or testimonials in the chat. You know, I love you people. I just love you people. I really do. Rachel, Dorothy, Ann Hawkins, Bat, Flavia. Oh, you guys are so nice. Thank you for whatever you are, whatever you were saying. You're making me blush. I'm sure. Uh, you know, I, uh, I, I just, I really appreciate y'all. I really do. I give you my heart and soul. Stephen Kimbrell. Hey, Andy. You have helped me so much over the years. Is it ever appropriate to ask the panel about their comp? Yes, 100%. And, and, and honestly, honestly, I don't know that I would want to, wait, is it okay to ask about company turnover? Yes, hell yes. I, I don't know that I'd want to bring it up in a panel. You could ask that in the screen. I mean, you could, you could ask that in the screen and a recruiter better damn well know that number. M Sport. Hey, Andy, unrelated to interviewing, but I wanted your thoughts on remote job productivity. Let's say you're a FTBA, full-time business analyst, in the office eight hours a day. Remotely, you could probably do the work in six hours. Well, you know what? Um, not, not this, I'm not saying this to be funny. What I have found, well, I don't have a statistic for this. It's observation. Most people in the office don't even work six hours, not even close. Farting around on their phone, coffee breaks, long lunches, even when they're staring at their screen, alerts are popping up. They're getting interrupted even with work stuff that isn't enabling them to do the work stuff. And so, you know, it isn't a this or that, uh, I think your productivity is a function of your production skills, and uh, that's how I how I look at it. The only thing I would say about somebody working remotely is you ain't wasting an hour this way or that way commuting, you know, that kind of stuff, or traveling. Gray 7, in the tech sector, I'd rather sit an exam assessment than do an interview storytelling, et cetera, is not my skill at all. Strange to have to go through this just to get hired. It's true because you're in sales mode, right? And selling is storytelling. M. Foreman, how do we overcome their sucky questions? I love that question. I love that question, Melissa. Uh, using none of yours or a limited amount of them, such a disservice to them and a waste of time. So you make their sucky questions not so sucky. So... Um, I don't know when, which, that's a great question, by the way. I don't know when you, oh goodness. I don't know when you asked that question. 
if you asked it before I got into the examples with Olivia, a uh, you know, little, little, little behind the scenes, Andy live shows. Do you know that every time I start a live show, there's certain things that I do, and one of them is grab paper towels in case I spill something. <laughs> I was like, I, I, I always feel like I'm gonna spill something, and, and and because I haven't been drinking enough water, and the water the water cup is getting sweaty, and then the water is dripping on the coaster, and then when I pick it up, it goes all over the desk, and I don't want the spots on my beautiful desk. Okay, total side note. Uh, all right, Melissa. I'm not sure if you asked this before I went through the process of hardening up their questions, but remember, even if their questions suck, hold on, this is how, first order business, you gave me a sucky question, but what do I need to tell you so that you can make a good decision? You didn't ask me this, but I'm going to tell you. Do you know that a lot of times, and by the way, this is not a, a knock on anybody, not even the interviewers or not any of you. You ask me questions in the, in the live chat. And a lot of times you'll hear me say, actually what you really need to know is, or what you could ask me is, or what's more important is. That's code for you didn't ask me what you should have asked me to get the information you needed. Now, that's okay. You don't, this is not your forte, right? You're not, you're not, I wouldn't expect you to know that. Okay, no, but interviewers, that's not their forte either. And so somebody says, hey, go in front of Melissa and, and ask her some questions and let me know if you want to work with her or if you'd hire her on your team. That's what they're doing. So you have to be better for both of them or both of you, right? You have to, you have to do this for both of you. And so uh, I, that's how I would do it is what is it they need to know? What, what is the story I can tell them to illustrate that? And the other thing that you can do is you can ask this, and this is okay. If they ask you a question you're not sure, you, I would do things like, why is that important to you? Or what is it about that you want to make sure I share? Or something like that. Believe me, you can ask it in a way where it's like, hey, I just want to give you what you need. And so I want to make sure that I'm, I'm getting at the heart of what you really want to know. Believe me, if, you have, if you've built good rapport with the interviewer and you're going back and forth, that's really easy to do. It may sound like, oh my God, Andy, how am I going to answer that? Because am I answering a question with a question? No, you're asking for clarification. And so that I give you the right insight. But you, you can do that. And then I also taught, like Olivia, how to harden it. They say, well, how would you handle the backlog? What kind of vague question is that, Right? like eight different things I would do depending on what it is, what control I had, who was the, had authority, who, right, who was directing that, who determined this, who's, which groups was more important. I mean, there's like so many things. So then you have, to, you have to strip it down and then say, oh, there are a number of factors I would use to prioritize it, including that hardens it up. All right, let's see. What else? Uh, Lu Kien, if I, hopefully I didn't mispronounce that. Uh, dear sir, I, you can call me Andy. Uh, I'm, I'm a final, final year student looking for an internship. Awesome. In the professional profile, I'm supposed to write a whole paragraph or bullet points. Lou, what I would do is, and can, uh, Kara, can we get, can we get, um, can we get Lou the, the collegiate template? And for any of my beloved college students, recent college graduates or anybody looking for internships, things like that, you want to use my collegiate template. And I've, I've literally written the paragraph for you. And it's basically like, take the, her school out, put your school in, put this out, take that in. And it's like, I literally wrote the paragraph for you. So it's just a paragraph up top. And Kara's saying, that's a wrap up the questions in the chat. I can pull additional ones from yesterday's session that weren't answered. You guys have no more questions? Don't make, I'll start selling you something if you don't ask me any more questions. <laughs> What's at the bottom? John Whitworth, totally agree with the point. Cynthia, what'd you say here? Andy's genuine and will help me. You got that right. He has a lot of experience and will really help answer your questions and go in the right direction. He's very professional. Trust me. I just love that and love you. Appreciate that. Andy plans everything. He optimizes organization and his life and his programs. That's true. That's true. All right, wait. I, 
ONV doing? I'm just going up the chat now. ONV doing. Here, let me see if I can get you. O N what was it? V? How do you manage? To, oh, wait, hang on. We got some questions here. ONV doing Juris doc. Okay. Andy, I just got a job after implementing your how to get the job after being rejected. All this karma is going to catch up with you in this life or the Damn right. I, you know what? Do you know what my book says today? Show up and teach your butt off. That's my whole goal for the day. That's it. You guys want to buy the program? That's a bonus. Okay? All right. Now, wait. ONV doing two. How do you manage the stress and awkwardness first three weeks in a new job? What if you're not very busy? So, uh, ONV doing two. Uh, what I would say there is when you get when you get into a new job, there are many, many activities for you and many goals, right? Because you're learning your new job, and but you're also learning the building. You're learning the people. You want to get a great understanding of who you're working with, what their goals in life are, how you can help them, all that good stuff. Start planning the structure for how to be most effective at your job. I don't know if you're in my leadership program. Uh, actually, I take that back. Actually, I've included as a bonus in the, actually, Carol, let's make sure this is on the page. I don't, I don't know if I, I called this out. I have a whole session in the, um, in the, in the, in the boot camp on the first, yeah, I did. Th there is your first 90 days on a new job. So if you are in either my job search coaching program, I gave you that as a bonus. There's a first 90 days session that goes into detail about the things that I'm saying. And then if you're, or if you're in my leadership coaching program, you get, you get a, you get a whole course on career development. And part of it is first 90 days. And then uh, that was the stress, and how do you manage the stress and the awkwardness? I, I, um, I, I, I manage stress by being planned. I also, I also have faith. Everything's going to work out. Everything will be fine. You've succeeded one hundred percent of your days. You know, kind of my there's mindset, attitude, and outlook. But that's that's what I would do. I would I would I would go through some of those steps and and try to meet the people and and say, hey, look, I, I want to introduce myself. I'd love to get an understanding of what you do, and I just I, I'm I'm trying to get to know everybody, and I just want to make sure that I can do whatever I can to make your life easier. And if you know if, if we're working together, or if there's anything I can do to make sure that I'm 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 giving you the stuff on the straight and narrow, that kind of stuff. All right, did any, anybody anybody else ask me questions that we might have? Uh, Adam Boots, you like the car technique. I'm just going up. And then Laura, yes, please send, please do a session on current questions to ask employers. I think that would be a very, very good one for us to do. All right, listen, we are actually, okay, wait, Teresa, let's get Teresa in here because I, um, I, I, I do, I do want to break at 12.45. Hey, Andy, I have the chance to have an informational interview with someone in the job I'm looking for. Do you have a list of great questions I should ask them? Now, Teresa, I don't know if you're a boot camper. I have a whole session in the boot camp of exactly how to run an informational interview, meaning how to control the agenda, what questions to ask, what to say. I have the scripts, what to say during the session, and then what to write exactly when you're done. Not a thank you email, but a, a follow-up action-packed email kind of thing. Uh, but you want to make sure that, you know, as, as a quick starter here for you, the questions when you're in an informational interview have to do with what their challenges are because what you're ultimately trying to do is what you're 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 trying to get here what are the problems you have so that I can show you that what I have might be able to help you and so that whether you're the person that could bring me on onto your team or you're the person that could refer me into your company or whatever it is, don't start talking about what you can do because the, the fastest route to getting hired in an in informational interview is that you solve or can solve the problems they have. It's like, hey, I could do 25 things. But I don't care about those 23 of those 25. I just need to know that you come with those two. So focus on that. All right. So, folks, I got to get running. But just to kind of recap this, uh, we are on with the boot campers here in 18 minutes. My job search coaching special, 500 off, runs through Monday. 
That's it. Monday midnight, the coupon expires, and forevermore, it's not going to be $4.97. It goes up to $9.97, although you could get the self-study for $6.97. And then uh, we've got a lot of other good stuff coming. I would give you dates if I could. My schedule's a little up in the air because tomorrow I start jury duty. Uh, so so that's, that's going to be a whole host of fun, federal jur jury duty. I don't know what that is going to be like at all, but I, I need to be somewhere in the morning. Uh, I think that's about it. Uh, I will leave the replays up. Make sure you grab the Ace Your Job interview uh, booklet, which is free if you want the interview intervention package for a, a uh, modest $7. You can get the whole package with a whole bunch of other stuff. Uh, one, of the, one of the things in the interview book package is, is an ebook called How to Interview the Employer, 75 Great Questions to Ask Before You Take Any Job. So that's uh, that. That's a real, real nice one too. Plus, you get the Ace Your Job interview little magazine booklet, like I showed you today. All right, folks, we good? We good? All right. Hope you guys enjoyed this as much as I enjoyed bringing it to you. For if you're in my boot camp, I'll see you in a in a few minutes here. For everybody else, for everybody else, have a great weekend. I will see you very soon. You'll still be getting golden emails from me in your inbox. Uh, Thursday live office hours will be back as soon as I'm back. Uh, so, so, so just have a great weekend and I will see you very soon. And I really love this. Thank you so much for your attention. It really means the world to me.